So now we move on to the actual part where the temporary system is built, or the start of the temporary system. Uh, it's split into three sections. We're first of all cross compile a tool chain, then some temporary cross compiling tools are built, and then in the true environment we build some final tools uh, for the temporary system. So there's uh, an extra bit here about preliminary information which describes how the cross compiler works. There's a bit of an overview here and how you can set up to keep track of uh, the compiling. This page here, the toolchain technical notes, it's very heavy going if you've not done anything uh, like cross compiling before, but it's laid out uh, in quite a good way, especially this latter half. It's a uh, a lot easier to read than the first bit. The first bit is the kind of description you might get if you read uh, like a wiki page or something. Uh, so maybe reading something else and reading this page might make it a bit more understandable. But it goes into details about how a cross compiler works and also how it works in the Linux from scratch more importantly because it's not strictly a proper cross compile. It's just using the, the cross compile techniques uh, that could be used on, on a different system. So, so I won't go through that, but it's uh, definitely worth reading. You probably want to read it several times, actually, to grasp all the concepts on there. It's a, it's a good write-up. General compilation instructions. So this just gives you some uh, instructions or some rules about going around or going about the compilation. If you stick to these rules, you will never have any problems. If you veer off from them or forget them, it's the chances are you'll either trash the system or you'll compile something and then you'll be getting errors and you you know you won't know why so as it says here let's check again that the LFS variable is set it is then it's got a couple of important points here to make sure that host requirements uh, have been met so yes that is really important not only that you've got those packages um, if you didn't have a package you'd find something wouldn't wouldn't build because the package is missing it needs that functionality but more importantly that the version is at least as high as the version that's listed in the host system requirements also that we've got bash in use again that's part of the host system requirements and that these symbolic links are active as well again if you've gone through the host system requirements and you've met all those requirements you've got nothing to worry about if you've skipped over that, then um, I'd say expect problems. Uh, unfortunately, that, that will happen. Uh, and to re-emphasize the build process, we've placed all the sources in the sources directory. And to build each package, you'll see me doing this. We go into the sources directory, you extract the, the package, you change into the directory that's created when you extracted the package, you follow the book's instructions, you go back to the sources directory and delete the source. And it's important that you delete the source, as it says on uh, E there, unless you're instructed otherwise. Because if you have a problem with it and you need to retry the build, you don't want any stale files or old stuff that you've built left lying around. Also, some packages are rebuilt more than once. Oh, sorry, built more than once. And when you rebuild them the second time, you don't want to be re rebuilding over what you've built previously. There's a chance that a configuration may be picked up that's not valid for the current state of the Linux from scratch build, but it might be picked up as, as the old state and that would affect the build as well. So you definitely do want to delete the source directory after you've built the package, as it says, unless instructed otherwise. Um, I can't think of anywhere off the top of my head where it does say to leave it there. The only one I would say to leave around is right at the very end where we build the kernel because it's handy to have if you want to go and adjust the kernel settings or you know add another driver or something like that. Um, apart from that, I can't think of anywhere, but this is a new version that may have changed something that may say like leave this, leave this here for the next chapter or whatever. Other than that, always delete the package after you've used it. So we're going to the first bit where we start building actual packages. So this is where we start to do the real work. 
and we start with bin utils. So as it says here, if you want to take timings to get an idea of how long the other packages will take based on the SBU that's given at the top of every package, then you'll want to use this little time uh, command here to time the uh, take uh, time how long it takes for the package to build. Um, I occasionally time the actual make command because that's the bit that does the building, uh, especially on bigger packages, just to get an idea of how long they take, uh, just for information really. But generally, I won't be using that. So as it says, let's change into the sources directory. So change into LFS sources. And first thing we do is tar minus XVF bin utils. Then we change into the source directory. Uh, by the way, um, in case you're wondering how I'm changing or typing in things so quickly, CD bin, I've typed bin. If you press tab, it will auto complete for you up to the point that it can, it can auto complete. If there's an ambiguity, for example, if I press tab twice, you can see it's completed up to the one there because that's the part of these two files or directories that matches. Uh, after that, it differs, and that's why it's presented to me after after two tabs, the options. So if I wanted the file, I'll type dot and press tab again. It will complete the file name. I only want the directory because I want to change into it, so that's fine. So we start off with the commands here, just copy and paste them in. As I said before, just copy and paste them in one at a time. This is one complete command. These backslashes just mean that the command carries on on the next line, and they've done this just to make it easier to read. So just copy and paste that in, and we can figure our first package, bin utils, and you can see that's quite quick. And then we run make. So I will time this just to get an idea of how long it takes to build this package. Paste that in and press enter. And if I want to monitor that all cores are being used, I can get another tab up, type in top, Z and 1. And you can see the CPUs are all got at least 50% usage in them roughly so they're all being used so that's that's good I'll go back to this tab uh, I'll get rid of this one actually so that the screen goes back to how it was that's it and just wait now it's, I think a couple of minutes for this to build this first one Okay, 48 seconds, a lot faster than I thought it would be. Okay, so we've run the make command. All we need to do now is to run make install. And you can see somewhere, yeah, it's run the install command and it's installing stuff into MNT tools and it's installed something into this directory. So you can see that all the temporary stuff is being installed into the tools directory and that's down to the fact that this prefix has got LFS tools in it. So if we were to look at that quickly you can see there's that x8664 LFS that's mentioned there. So we've come to the end we've just done run make install the next thing we've got to go back to the sources directory because we're two directories up, we need to go down. Or, or sorry, we're two directories down. We need to go back up twice, or you could do cd dollar lfs four slash sources, whichever's convenient for you. Back in the sources directory, you need to remove the uh, source directory now. Bin utils, and that's the first package done. And now it's just a case of going through the book uh, and following the instructions as before so tar minus xvf gcc wait for that to extract 
Um, and as the note suggests there, there's misunderstandings frequently about this chapter because it's slightly different to the others. There's nothing really different about it. Once you extract it, extracted it, you change into the directory. I'm now in the directory of the source I've just unpacked. So this is the time where I'll start following the instructions. So I'll start off with this tar command here. That's done. Move command. That's done. You can see it's telling you what it's done there. Another tar command. And a move command. Tar command. As I said, if there's no response, come back like the tar command. It's worked. Um, and these ones here, it's just the uh, information, a bit of information is coming out because the verbose switch has been used on a move. On 64 bit, we need to do this command here. Again, you can run this if you're on 32 bit because it does actually test to see if we're on 64 bit and if you're on 32 bit, it just wouldn't do anything. So it's not a problem. Then we create the build directory and change into it and then we copy this command here paste that in that's complete and we'll run make and I'll run make on this uh, time on this to see how long this takes and this this will be a few minutes five or ten minutes or so
Right, so that's finished compiling, so we can now run the install command. And finally there's just a couple of commands here to finish off the build. And that's complete for the first pass of GCC. So again we go back to the top which is the sources directory and remove the GCC source package, that uh, source directory, don't delete the package. Move on to the Linux headers, API headers. So once again, extract the tarball. and then change into the directory that's been created from the extraction and we can run these commands now first one's to clean the um, source directory then we make the headers then there's some of them are deleted make files deleted as well and then they're just copied into the place where they should be. That's it. So finished up. We delete the source directory again and move on to the next package, glibc. And again, extract the tarball. You can see this hasn't completed the full tarball name. That probably means it's a patch. Um, if you do see this, don't type full stop just to get the rest of the file do actually press tab twice because it could be and I've done this before several times um, it could be that you forgot to delete the, the um, source directory from the previous build so glibc gets be, uh, built a few times a couple of times um, and it could be if this was in the second time it could be that I've forgotten to delete the original one so just press tab a couple of times just to see why it stopped you can see it has stopped because there is a patch file um, and the source tarball is, is the one we want uh, if there was the old file then obviously there'd be uh, old directory there would be three um, names come up there and you'd be able to see all oh, right okay before I extract this tarball I've got to delete the old output directory uh, before I extract the tarball afresh So change into glibc. Then we've got a case statement here. So this is for 32-bit and 64-bit, the looks of it. Um, it just creates a symlink for LSB compliance, the looks of it. <coughs> uh, looks like it's created a couple there for 64-bit. So now we run the patch in. And Again, a build directory is created, change into that directory, and now we can run the configure command. That's all done. Now it says here that there have been reports that the this make command may fail with J1. Um, I have to admit, I do remember years and years ago, the glibc wasn't all that happy with the parallel compile but I can't say that I've seen it for a long time so whether there are still systems or host operating systems where it does fail or not I don't know but the chances are it, it will build in parallel so I, I wouldn't worry about it too much um, as it says there if you find that it does fail for whatever reason it fails just try running the rerun the make command you can carry on it'll make or carry on rerun it with minus J1 to see if it will actually carry on building um, and if it does and obviously you've, you've unfortunately got one of these systems where it has failed to build in parallel uh, for whatever reason that might be um, if it does fail again with the same error then or similar error if there's obviously some other issue and it's nothing to do with the parallel make so I think this is a few minutes for this one to finish
Okay, that's finished, it's just under three minutes. So we can install it now with this command. And it says here, warning if LFS is not properly set and despite recommendations, your building's root. Um, so the next command will install the newly built GDBC into your host system. So uh, as it says, most likely render it unusable. It almost certainly will. Uh, so let's, we know we're at LFS because the prompt says so there. We'll just check we've got the LFS variable set. We must have because it's we're using it. So it's just a double check, but yeah, just, just be wary of what's happening here. If the LFS was empty, then Desta would default to the root, I think. Um, so it would then just write, overwrite your host. Oh, in fact, it says here, if it's, if it's not set, it defaults to the root directory. Which is why it's so important to not be the root and to have LFS set. Okay, so that's installed. What they've got now is this box out is all about testing. It's a very basic test to see that the um, tool chain that we've just finished installing um, is actually valid and does what's expected. So just enter these three commands and it just creates a basic C file, compiles it, and then just uh, extracts some information from uh, the uh, metadata of, of that file that's created and you can see the output is forward slash lib64 ld linux x6 x 664so and that message should exactly match what's here it will be slightly different if you're on 32-bit um, oh it says here what it will be for 32-bit so as long as you've got that for 64-bit or that libldlinux.so.2 on this part of the message for 32 bit then everything's fine if not you need to as it says go back and find out what happened you've probably missed something out or uh, you know some other problem need to be verified need to verify what what that was for carrying on so we can clean up the test files not absolutely necessary because we will be deleting this build directory anyway but we can do it um, and it says building packages in the next travel tool serve as an additional check that the tool chain has been built correctly. And if, if any of them fails, it's an indication something's gone wrong with previous uh, one of these tool chain packages. So one more command to run is this make headers command. And that's finished. That's GDFC done for this part. So once again, go back to the sources directory and remove the source directory for GDBC. Um, now we need to install the libstandard C++ library and it says why it's built separately from GCC here. So we need to extract the GCC package again. change into it and now we can run the commands to build this part of GCC so again a separate build directory a config command And then can run make. And that's complete. So we'll just run this last command in to install it. And we're done. Let's go back to the sources directory and remove the GCC source directory. And now we finish this cross-compiling toolchain direct uh, 
chapter, we can move on to the next chapter, which is cross-compiling temporary tools.